Hi everyone and welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with the one and only Professor Butler Schaefer. Uh, Butler is a professor of law at Western Law School and the author of quite a few books, several of which he's talked about here on Liberty.me. And he's, he's been writing and engaging with the ideas of libertarianism uh, for decades now. So it's uh, just wonderful that we have him here as a tremendous resource. Uh, so tonight he's going to be talking about, on the topic of his book, Boundaries of Order, Private Property is a Social System. Uh, certainly, probably anyone who's listening to this is not going to, to uh, have to take much convincing uh, that private property is a good thing. But a lot of people don't believe it, and it, a lot of people, even who do believe it, don't understand quite how important it is to the fabric of a society. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Butler Schaefer. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think what you said at the end is is the problem, and that is that um, just about everyone is in favor of private ownership of property in the sense that they want to privately own their property. And you find this with conservatives, libertarians, and so forth, that if you ask them, do you believe in privately owned property, they're going to say yes. But what we tend not to understand is what does that mean? What, is it, what does the concept mean? Is it about things? And this is our normal thought on the subject that when we're talking about a property concept, we're talking about my relationship to things, my relationship to my car, to my house, to my book, to whatever it is that I may have. It's my relationship to those things, and it's not. And that's the problem. Um, the property concept is really a form of social metaphysics, if you will, in the sense that it, it is at the core of defining uh, the question, who gets to make decisions about what? So when we're talking about property, we're not talking about my relationship relationship to my car or my relationship to my video camera or to my computer or whatever it is, we're talking about my relationship to you in connection with the car or the computer or the house or whatever. So it's a social relationship. It's not a relationship with things. In fact, if you stop and think about it, the idea of having a relationship with a car or a house or a computer is a little bit strange. I mean, what does that mean? Did you send it the flowers on a, a particular day of the year or what? No, it's of how do you and how do you and I relate to one another with respect to the computer or the car or the house or whatever it is we're talking about. And it's it's basically it's a Robinson Crusoe problem. <clears throat> um, when Crusoe found himself on this island in which he imagined that he was alone, there was going to be no one else around, he didn't have a property problem. He didn't have a property question at all. If you or I was the last person on the planet, uh, what kind of property interests could we exercise? And it's whatever we want to do. As the only person on earth, uh, <clears throat> where where might I live? Wherever I want to. In some <clears throat> house in Beverly or wherever it might be, yeah, that's 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 good. Uh, what what about the car? Well, there's that Lamborghini that's parked out there. It used to probably used to belong to someone, no one else around anymore. So I can I can use it. Food supplies, whatever. It now becomes my relationship to the rest of the world in terms of of how I'm going to survive, but it's not a property question. Now, as Robinson Crusoe discovered, when Friday shows up, when he sees that footprint in the sand, now he knows he's in society with somebody else. And being in society with others means he and this other person are going to have to come to some sort of an arrangement about how they're going to exercise decision-making power over the things in the world that they need uh, in order to live. 
live. That is, it's not just you know food and water and air and things of this sort, because the things that you and I need in order to live well are going to include an awful lot of things that goes beyond simply survival. So we have to find some kind of a principle that's going to serve that in that way. We have to find out, you know, who gets to make decisions about about things in the world. And this begins with a of of questions. One of which is the question of who can be an owner. Who is an owner? And this is why when I get into these questions with my students, this is the first question. Do you own yourself? And if you're never accustomed to asking that question, you hear an awful lot of simplicity. Like, yeah, well, sure, yeah, I own myself. Why not? Next question. Uh, but I remind them that there are implications to how you answer that question. And whichever way you answer it, you're going to be troubled by it. You're going to be twisting and turning and, and having all kinds of problems. Because if you say, yes, I own myself, what does that mean? Well, that means, first of all, we have to identify who your self is. Uh, is it just your body? Is it uh, you know, other aspects of your, uh, of your life? Is it your sense of aesthetics? Is it, you know, whatever. But let's assume that you just do it on the simplest level that in terms of your body as a, as, as a property interest. And you say, yes, I own myself. Then at least with the consequences of that, well, if you own yourself, why do you other people to make coercive decisions over your life? You know, ownership is a, is a function of control. The person who really is able to affect control over something is the owner. It doesn't matter what the uh, formal system is in terms of, of recognizing that. It's like uh, what it, it's why fascism has worked so well for the modern corporate state. Because under a system of fascism, fascism is not defined in terms of concentration camps where people are gassed and so forth. I mean, it's just, that's the way one of them happened to, uh, to operate. But it's not, that's not a central a system of fascism. If you look it up in a good dictionary, a thorough dictionary, you'll discover it's a system in which title to property is owned privately, but control is exercised by the state. So I may have title to my house, title to my car, whatever it may be, but the state tells me what I can or can't do with it. And so if this is, if you're operating on the assumption of, yes, I have self-ownership, what does that mean? You just some form of title, some kind of documentation, a birth certificate or something like that, that the state will recognize, but the state is going to go insist on controlling your actions. What does it mean then to be a, a self-owning person? And you play that one out. And so eventually I get students to say, well, all right, I, yeah, I can, I, I don't own myself. I said, okay, if that's your conclusion, then what possible objection can you have to what anyone else wants to do with respect to you? If you don't own yourself and somebody wants to coerce you in some fashion, make you a slave, want to have you for dinner, whatever it may be, what objection could you have to whatever it is they want to do if you don't own yourself? Where, where, where do you object? I just say, I don't like it. Well, okay, that's, that's fine, but that doesn't, doesn't get you very far. The fish that you catch in a stream and eat probably doesn't like being eaten either, but so far we haven't been extending the concept of self-ownership to fish and carrots and, and the like. So we have to be very careful with this. I have to think it through. And I tell my students the first, first day of class, by the, by the end of the year, whichever way you answer this question, you're going to be squirming. 
you're not going to like the, the consequences. Because if you do have self-ownership, why do you put up with all this control being exercised over you by others? And if you don't have self-ownership, what's the basis of your objection? How can you object to something and, and without saying, no, I, I have a better claim than the state might have to me? So we play around with, with, with that. And you get to the question, the, the, the basic elements of, of property, the, what I call the boundary claim and control. These, these are ideas that are, I, I have borrowed from uh, Robert Lefebvre, with whom I worked at Rampart College for a couple of years. And, and I, I think he's pretty well identified the basic elements for what you need to consider in doing uh, an analysis of property ownership. Boundary means what? What is it that's being claimed as a basis of ownership? What, what is the it that owns? Uh, is it a dog? Is it a car? Is it a computer? Is it myself? Is it, what is it? So what is the definition of a boundary. And that's not always easy. I, I often start off a, a class when we're dealing with that question by just going up to some student and put my, putting my face right up by their face. And I don't, I don't touch their face at all. I don't touch their, their, their skin at all. But they're always uncomfortable. And I say, so what, what's the problem? Uh, have I trespassed you? <clears throat> and they will acknowledge, no, I hadn't. I hadn't touched the skin at all. And I said, well, think about that. Have I trespassed you? Does your property boundary extend beyond simply your epidermis? And I give as an example of that to play around with. You get on an elevator. You're the only person on the elevator and someone else gets on and comes up and stands right next to you. You feel trespassed, right, under those circumstances. But what if it's a crowded elevator and that same person now stands as close to you as he was in the, uh, the first example? Well, you might not feel trespassed in that situation. And then you can change the facts around you. Know, what if it, that uh, person who's uh, who you feel annoyed by is a friend. If it's a friend, you're probably not going to feel annoyed and so forth. So boundaries aren't always that clearly defined. But, but the concept is, the concept we have to know, what, what is it that I am going to claim ownership to? What is it that I say is mine to make this about? And ultimately, you then have, well, you then get down to the, the claim element. Claim meaning what? Uh, what is the basis upon which I assert a right to be immune from your trespasses? Now, this is mine. Uh, what's the basis for that? And where does it go? Because it's, you, you get to questions that the, the, the claim question ultimately, come, ultimately comes down to the issue of who can destroy something without asking someone else's permission. Doesn't mean you have to destroy something or to own it, but it means you have to find out who the person is who has a sufficient claim to be the exclusive decision maker over something whose boundary we have now determined. And that becomes very, very troublesome if you haven't thought it through. And, and this is one thing that troubles the state so much with the question of suicide. If you own yourself, uh, does your claim of ownership include the right to destroy yourself? 
And courts have trouble with this. The legal system has trouble with it, mainly because they don't want people to get in the habit of thinking that they have self-ownership. Because if you think of it in those terms, uh, it's going to extend into an awful lot of other areas. Well, if I am entitled to destroy myself, why am I not entitled to keep everything that I produce? Why am I not entitled to paint my house chartreuse and fuchsia if I want to? Why am I not entitled to do any other thing that involves my exercising exclusive decision making over something that I claim to own? And this is why when you see questions like this coming up in a legal, does someone have the right to uh, suicide? The answer that the legal system so the answer that the political establishment comes up with, well, you should go to court and let a court decide that. You know, if you had some horrible disease, very painful, there's no cure for it, and there's just, you're going to spend the rest of your life in just horrible, agonizing pain for which there is no possibility of recovery. Uh, and then the judge will then decide whether or not you could self in. What's the implication of that? The implication is owns you. And if you accept that, then what you're also accepting is the idea uh, that you are the property of the state, that state's agents, whoever they may be, a judge in this particular case, uh, can de decide what is to become of you. You see this in the military. Uh, people who really think this through in a military setting uh, acknowledge, you know, yeah, you as a soldier are the property of the state and its duly assigned officers can direct what is to be done with you. You're going to charge up that hill because the colonel says so. Well, then you better charge up the hill because you're just the, uh, you're just the chattel. It belongs to the state. The state has designated this as being the one who can dispose of of its interest in you. Anyway, it seems. Well, the third element we have here of control, and it's kind of implicit in what I've already talked about. Control meaning gets to make the decision making, taking over what. And sometimes it gets very complicated, but it's complicated in a way that if you understand the principles involved, you can work your way through it without any difficulty. For instance, do I own my house? Well, let's say that you come from the answer, yes, I do. Okay, that's fine. Suppose I have borrowed some money from the bank, and as security for the repayment of that loan, the bank as a mortgage or deed of trust placed on my house, which, which I've done. Uh, now do I have the right as property owner to destroy what I own, my house? Well, there's someone else involved that also has a property interest here. So my property interest is reconfigured from not just the house, but the house minus the mortgage that the bank might have on it. So I could not, without committing a trespass on the bank's interest, could not destroy the house on my own. The same, the same thing with uh, if I'm renting the property to somebody else. I had a student one time who came in to, to see me and she said, well, oh, uh, my landlord just told me that uh, he sold the building that I have my apartment in, and I'm going to have to move out. Is that true? And I said, how long <clears throat> How long a lease did you sign? He said, it's a three-year lease. There's about two years to go. So is there anything in the lease that gives the option to a buyer to uh, cancel the lease? He said, no. Well, then tell him that I've forgotten the exact terminology, but if I, something along the line of, you know, go jump in the lake. It's just... 
uh, you have a property interest. You have a property interest in the apartment that you're renting. And when the new buyer comes along, he takes subject to existing property interest. So he's going to have to put up with that. Now, if he can get the landlord, your present landlord, to agree to, to sort of intimidate you into thinking that you have to leave, well, so be it. But if you're, and if you're dumb enough to, to play that game, you know, you know those, are, those are the consequences you'll end up suffering. But there can be a lot of ownership associated with things that we imagine that if, if, if we think of it simply in terms of my relationship to the house, for example, or my relationship to the car, we get into trespass situations that can, as a matter of principle, be worked out if we think of the relationship in terms of my relationship to somebody else my relationship as my tenant, my relationship to the bank as, as having a security interest uh, in that house so that I, I am not the sole owner of the house. Someone else has a, a particular interest as well. And, and you work, work that through and it becomes, uh, as a matter of principle, something that's not all that difficult to to deal with. I, I have another area I want to get into. I don't know if there's anyone has any questions at this point. I don't going all the way up to the end and then break any questions. Are, are there any questions one wants to interject? If not, I can go on. I don't have any questions loaded up so far. Okay. All right. Now, I, as I've said before, the property concept <clears throat> and I developed this in my Boundaries of Order book, that all of our social relationships, and the word is all, A-L-L, -L, all of our social relationships involve questions of property. Who make decisions about what? We tend to that over mainly because we we live in a system that doesn't want us to think in terms of pretty ideas. We have crimes, for example. Do crimes involve property trespasses? Well, some do and some don't. The ones that we call victimizing crimes do. Murder, rape, robbery, arson, etc., all involve an act of violence against someone else's property interests. But what about the crimes of prostitution, drug use, gambling, you know, whatever else that fall into what we think of as victimless crimes? A victimless crime is nothing more than a crime, an activity that's been decreed by the state to be a crime for which there's no trespass. There's no injury that's occurred to another person. Everything else like this, the war system, war is property trespass, property violations on a massive scale. Countries can go after one another and destroy territory, destroy buildings, kill people, injure people. So well, these are all property trespasses. We, what we talk about in terms of pollution, I say, well, that's that's a problem involving the environment. No, it's not. That's our way of hiding our misunderstanding of what's at stake. If somebody engages in, you know dumping all of the toxic waste of their productive activity into the air and someone else has to breathe that in is a trespass. Someone dumps 
their toxic wastes into a river or just out onto the ground and it gets into the underwater, the, the groundwater of, of that locale. Uh, and somebody else gets into that river and swims in it or catches fish and eats the fish that have been subjected to this uh, toxic waste or gets into the underground water and people drink that from their wells and they're drinking in part of the toxic waste. These are all property trespasses. But you know, we're not supposed to think of it in those terms. We're supposed to think of it in terms of, of an offense to the environment. What, what on earth does that mean? Is the environment a, an owning kind of entity, a self-owning entity? We say it has rights. You know, it's like, it's like the, the, the question that uh, the late Justice William O. Douglas came up with, the idea of, well, maybe trees have rights. What, what does this mean? Or animal rights people, animals have rights. What does this mean? You know, when you ask people to walk through that, what are the implications of that? Well, are they, if, if, if an animal has the same rights as you do, uh, how do we know what the animal wants? How do we know whether uh, eating that animal would be a violation of its, of its sense of will? And if so, does, does the animal or the tree or anything else non-human have a right to participate in the decision making involving what's going to happen to trees and animals and rocks and things of this sort? Do they get to vote? Do they get to run their own candidates for office? <clears throat> I think this has been done with regard to sheep. I think <laughs> the sheep have their own constituency, but it's, you know, made up of most of members of what H.L. Mencken called the bourgeoisie. But when you, when you walk through this, you find that it's difficult to think about the notion of, of, of property interests outside the realm of being human. How, you know, what is it that, that uh, makes us want to extend to, let's say, a raccoon or a chicken or whatever, <clears throat> the same respect of inviolability that we would to another human being. Now, it's this, the property concept is not something humans invented. This is one thing that I think a lot of people get confused over. And the assumption is, well, this is just an idea. And we can just change the ideas. Well, you get into questions involving how animals, plants, and so forth, also are territorial in nature. <clears throat> Animals will assert a claim of ownership over what is theirs. Any of you who have a dog or a cat have probably seen your pet go out and urinate around, not necessarily the legal description of the land as you see it, but around what it considers to be its uh, realm of ownership. And that is designed to identify a boundary, <clears throat> again, against which other members of the same species are expected to respect. And there's been a number of works done on this. Conrad Lorenz won the Nobel Prize one year for work on titled On Aggression, which related all of this to the property principle. Robert Ardrey has done some very interesting work on it in the, 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 his book, The Territorial Imperative, and pointing out how other life forms have to identify and defend and protect claims to ownership because our lives depend upon our being able 
to exert some degree of control over the world that we live in. That's not something I made up. It's not an idea. It's just the, the reality of things. There are trees, for example, that will exude the kind of poison from its leaves that will prevent other plants from being able to uh, have their offspring come into the area around which the poison has been uh, secreted. Its own children, if you will, its own children can grow there, but not things from other trees or plants. Not all trees and plants do that, <clears throat> just that there have been a number that have been, been known to do this. Um, fish, <clears throat> and fish and birds and so forth will establish territorial claims. It's been suggested that when fish, I'm sorry, when, when, when birds are singing, what they're doing is creating their territorial boundary. I, I don't know that that's true. I mean, we do an awful lot of projecting of our own traits onto the rest of the world. Imagine that this is the way the rest of the world sees things. It's kind of like you know, the, 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 the queen bee in a hive, we think of her as a queen. She's running the whole show. No, she's not. She's just <laughs> the hive's reproductive system, and that's that's it. But but the creatures involved in all of this do have their own claims to be exclusive decision makers amongst members of their own species. Or when Conrad Lorenz first encountered this, first had this experience, he was swimming somewhere off the coast of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef or someplace like that. And he was just swimming along and suddenly saw some big dark object coming his way. And you know, when you're swimming and you see something like that, your first thought is probably, oh, oh, what's this? As he got closer and as they got closer to him, he discovered it was a school of fish of a particular species. And when they got to him, they turned around and followed him the rest of where he was going. And at some point, they just sort of disappeared. And Lorenz thought, well, that's interesting. We kept on swimming, and pretty soon he sees another dark object coming toward him. And when it finally <clears throat> gets to where he is, <clears throat> excuse me, he discovers it's another school of fish of the same species. <clears throat> and they're checking him out. We thought, you know, you might be a member of that of this species, but you're not, you're something else, so we'll let you go. So he, he tried testing this out. He took uh, members of a particular school of fish, put them in a big tank with some sand on the bottom and everything else, and let them be there for a while, and then took some other members of the same species, but from a different group, put them in the same tank. And all kinds of conflict ensued. Get out of here. You know, this is this is ours. And there have been some very interesting photographs of boundaries <clears throat> created by fish in tanks where you know this this is ours. You you stay away. So it's <clears throat> it's something that's associated with life. I even go so far as to suggest that you know the a, a boulder for example, a great big rock. Is it just a thing? Is it does it have a property concept? <clears throat> I don't know how much we can we can attribute free will to a rock, although there are a lot of physicists who claim with the idea that maybe all matter has some form of of, of consciousness, albeit at a very simplified level, but you don't need to get into that, <clears throat> at least at this point. It's sufficient to say that this rock uh, is the only thing that can occupy that particular space. And this is where the exclusiveness of ownership arises. You know, if, if you and I are in nature and we are competing for space, we're doing it with the idea that 
<clears throat> that someplace along the way here, we're going to have to <clears throat> figure out how you can occupy some space and I occupy an, another space. Because there's no way we can both occupy the same space at the same time. <clears throat> and so this comes out in terms of uh, how we respect one another's claims of ownership. It also gives rise to the opportunity for contracts. I believe it was um, the legal, great legal mind, uh, Blackstone, who once said that a contract is nothing more than an agreement by two or more persons to exchange claims to the ownership of things. And if you think it through, uh, you can see it. If I'm, <clears throat> if I'm going to sell you my house or my car or my computer, am I really selling you the house or the car or the computer? Or am I selling you my claim to it? If someone buys you a computer as a birthday present, where do they get it? Well, they go to a store that sells these things. What is it they're selling? Are they selling computers or are they selling their claim to the computer? This is why <clears throat> you buy something from a thief. You say, well, he doesn't really have any legitimate claim, so therefore transaction that attempts to transfer ownership from a thief to you know, good faith purchasers is null and void. The thief did not have <clears throat> a claim to the ownership of whatever it is he's trying to sell you. So we we extend that out. So cousin Louis wants to buy you a, a computer as a birthday present. He goes to the store and he finds a computer he would like to buy. And what he's buying is the claim. <clears throat> the store owner's claim to that computer. Pays money for it. This is a real contract. Involves <clears throat> an exchange of, of claims. He gets the claim that he had to his money. And Cousin Louis gets the claim to the ownership of the computer. Brings it home, wraps it up in a nice package, and gives it to you on your birthday. But it's again, it's not the thing that you're getting. It's a claim to the ownership of the thing. Again, if, if you or I were the only person on the planet, through whatever means, and the question arises, well, where can I live? What can I eat? Where, where can I go? Wherever you want. There is nobody else there who can provide a competing claim to that. It sounds strange because we don't experience that, but there's nothing any more strange about that than <clears throat> the idea of owning the moon. Let's say I I, I, I would like to. So I publish notices in newspapers all over the world, and I've checked it out. I haven't found one who's claimed ownership of the moon, and so I said, "All right, I want the world to know that Butler Schaefer hereby lays claim to the ownership of that object up there in space, known as the moon." I might even provide a photograph of it for the in <laughs> the intellectually challenged who went through government schools and might not recognize the moon, but be that as it may. <clears throat> and so here's, here's some, does it have a boundary? Yeah. This is what we call it. It's like a chattel in that situation. <clears throat> a chattel is a form of property that is its own boundary, like a pencil or watch or radio or something like that. The boundary is the item in question. So in that sense, you can say, well, all right, the moon is a as a self-contained boundary. It's clear what it is, and so I, I hereby lay claim to it. Do I have I established a claim? Well, yeah, I tell the rest of the world, this is mine. You know, everyone else stay off. 
So why, why, why may I not lay claim to the ownership of it? Well, the element of control comes in. What does it mean to own something if you aren't in a position to control it? This is one of the things we're familiar with from <clears throat> the days when explorers who represented the king of Laurel River, Britannia or someplace went out into the world, found a piece of land that nobody else had claimed, stuck a flag in the ground and said, I hereby claim this parcel of land for the king of Lower Ruritania. Would, from a property principle, would that claim be entitled to respect? It might be with respect to the specific area where the flag is placed, but beyond that, what kind of decision making can one exercise over over an entire <clears throat> continent, let's say, or over an entire thing like the moon? Now let's suppose that I say, well, if I get up to the moon, there's one particular uh, spot on the moon that uh, I would like to lay claim to it. And so I go up there, maybe stake out a boundary and put a sign up there. This, this particular portion of the moon belongs to Schaefer. No trespassing. Trespassers will be violated or something like that. Would that claim then be entitled to, to respect? Well, here you get into the question of the absentee owner. Certainly if I'm up there, if I'm going to figure out some way to stay up there on my own, which might include, you know, having, <laughs> being able to find food, mm -hmm. air to breathe, water to drink, and so forth. Uh, presumably I could do that. But what if I then come back to Earth? Is it now my, do I continue to have that claim of ownership? And this is a question that we often get into with regard to property, the absentee owner. This this is something that has always troubled socialists. You know, how can you own something, be away from it for a sufficient period of time and still claim ownership of it? Well, you continue to exercise control. And if so, why not? Why couldn't you lay claim to it? Now, now these are hypothetical designed to test a principle. They're not anything that we're likely to be encountering in the real world uh, anytime soon. But they're a way of taking the relationships that we have to one another here on Earth and figuring out a way to deal with one another without committing trespasses, which is another way of saying without using coercion, without using violence. And this ultimately, I think, is why political systems are very troubled by the idea of wanting to have people entertain the idea of self-ownership, or even having the concept of property be explored in any particular, you know, with any particular depth. So it's going to raise questions that are going to cause some people to say, hey, wait a minute, why? You know, if I if I own myself in this kind of a setting, what about what about something else? And what about taxation? Is that a taking of my property interest? Oh, we can't have, we can't have the serfs asking those kinds of questions. It's the same kind of question that came up in the the Dred Scott case. Is Dred Scott for those who if you're not familiar with it? Dred Scott was a case that tested the uh, the ownership claim of of an individual slave vis-a-vis -vis his slave master. I won't get into the details of what made it an interesting uh, legal question, but it ultimately came down to this question of whether or not a slave, for example, can claim the self-ownership or whether or not his master has a property claim in the slave that entitles that relationship 
to continue. And the Supreme Court in that case ruled no, that Dred Scott remained a slave. His status hadn't changed and so forth. He was remained the property of his master. The master could free him if he wanted to, but until he had done that, he couldn't. The master could sell him to someone else, but the someone else bought the same claim of ownership as if a man sold his cattle or a horse or something like that to somebody else. Well, we say, well, we we don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't, that, that's no longer a question in our society, isn't it? What What is it that slavery is premised upon the idea of some people owning other people, meaning some people owning a right to have other people subject to their decision-making authority. I've often commented on the 13th Amendment, which we think, well, that ended slavery. No, it didn't. Read it. What the 13th Amendment did, it nationalized slavery. It said private parties can no longer own slaves, but the state can. The state can through conscription, through taxation, so forth. Soldiers, young men who were drafted into the military to go off and serve the interests of the state. This isn't a system of slavery. If, if not, you know, people need to do some clarification of their thinking. And it's, it's a question that still arises in the abortion issue. Is the unborn child a self-owning being or is the unborn child an extension of the property of the mother? If it's an extension of the property of the mother and the state interferes with what the mother is doing and having an abortion, then the state has interfered with her property interest, hasn't it? On the other hand, if the child <clears throat> is a self-owning being, which I believe that it is, I uh, have long taken the view that the, uh, the claim of self-ownership arises at the point at which the unborn child acquires its own DNA. At that particular point, it's unique. It is a unique being in the universe. And so if the mother takes some action to <clears throat> destroy the unborn child, she's committed an act of trespass. Now at this point, in terms of our kind of dualistic patterns of thinking, people tend to jump to the conclusion, aha, <clears throat> so you think it's all right for the state to prevent women from doing this or to punish her for having done it? No, I don't. Because even though the unborn child is a self-owning being, so is the woman. And if the state can intervene to punish the woman for this, then the state has trespassed her. How do you work your way out of that? The only thing to work it out, I'm happy to <clears throat> consider any good arguments that don't involve violence. The only way I can see of working that out is it's the woman's decision. You know, anything short of that involves the state in exercising coercive authority over the woman's self-ownership claim. Any questions at this point? Anything yet? Uh, I, I still don't have questions uh, loaded in here in the queue. Uh, you guys who are if you're writing a question, just type in the chat to let me know that you're writing one. But if we don't have one of the, uh, a message like that uh, within a few seconds, uh, Vincent. Okay, Vincent is typing a question. 
okay. interestingly, we had uh, Walter Block on here last night, and he mentioned... I like your, Walter. Be nice to Walter. <laughs> he, uh, he mentioned that he liked too, and uh, he mentioned that your uh, long-running disagreement over uh, the abortion question. Yes. Yeah. We, we've talked about uh, that a lot. Uh, we've got Vincent's question here. Uh, he asks if what you hold is more of a consequentialist view of property rights than deontological. I have no idea what the implications. Of, I, I know the I know the terminology. I I, I don't like to get into anything on that other than. What 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 is the nature what is the nature of life? What does it mean to live? And how do we respect life not just as a philosophic principle, but as something <clears throat> far beyond that? I, I have a great deal of sympathy. I have a lot of animal rights friends and students and so forth. I greatly respect the concern they have for treating other life with respect, even though all of life exists by having to feed on other living things. You know, we, we don't live very well by eating bowls of dirt. So we're going to go eat plants, we can go eat animals, we can, you know, eat something. The question is, in the course of doing that, or in the course of just how we live generally, we live, even if we have to kill and consume other living things, can we do it with respect? And I think this is where uh, the notion of, of grace that people express before a meal may, may come into play. I think if you go all the way back, and I know that the, the Chinese and the, the people been involved in Eastern philosophy for quite a few years, I think would take the position that what you're doing is not thanking some imagined anthropomorphic deity for providing this particular meal or providing the fish or whatever, but you're thanking the animal itself, showing a sense of appreciation. I was at a, a dinner with one night that some friends of ours had, had put together and the, the man had fixed a really wonderful chicken dinner and so forth. And one was over with her and said, well, let's, let's, let's hear it. I won't use the guy's name. Let's, just, let's hear it for Frank. And I just said, let's hear it for the chicken. I mean, the chicken was the one that had, had uh, really provided the uh, the substance of what it was we were eating. There's a great prayer in the old Jimmy Stewart movie, Shenandoah, and I always have to remind people of this because I know so many libertarians have never even heard of it. If you haven't heard of or seen the, the movie Shenandoah, go, go to Netflix or wherever else and borrow a copy of it. But he has this wonderful prayer, you know. Uh, he says that you know, we have all the things we have because we cleared the fields, we planted the crops, we watered the crops, we hoed the crops, we did all these things, and we harvested the crops at the end of the season. If we didn't, haven't done those things, we wouldn't have what we have to eat, but we thank you anyway, oh Lord. Uh, that's, that's always been my, been my attitude toward this. So to me, it's a, it's a question of how we, I, th I think, how we deal with these issues vis-a-vis -vis one another as human beings is different from how we deal with them as in terms of other species. I think we're locked into that until we can figure out some way to create negative entropy, if you want to put it in those terms, which is what eating is, you know, the life 
life is an entropic process. And if, if we don't do something to reverse the entropy, we just we just die. This is what what a diet is. When people are going on a diet in one form or another, they're basically uh, you know allowing entropy to kind of take over. We're not they're not going to reverse that. We're not going to create negative entropy. You you do it in a controlled fashion. But I'm more interested in in how we how we conduct ourselves regarding other people. How do, how do we do this? For example, even with our own children. Do you own your children? This goes back to the self-ownership principle. Do you own your children? Well, think that one through. If you say, yes, I own my, I own my child. Um, well, if ownership involves the right to destroy something that you own, can you then destroy the child that you own, if it's yours, if it's your property? And most people are understandably troubled by that. No, I don't want to do that. So you don't own your child. No, I don't own my child. Okay. Well, if you don't own your child, uh, I was, I'm going to come by your house about 4 o'clock this afternoon and pick up your child because I have some work I would like him to do in my yard, raking leaves or something like that. So just make sure he's available. Well, why should I do that? Well, what business is it of yours why you should do it? You said you don't own, own the child, so what are you going to do? Well, here, you now you start forcing people into uh, going into a deeper level of questioning. Maybe you don't own the child. Maybe you own a relationship with the child. Maybe you own uh, something that husbands and wives have vis-a-vis -vis one another. Do you own your spouse? Well, not in the sense that I could kill them. If I could kill them, there's, there's nothing wrong there. But, but you, you do have some kind of a property interest there in the same way that an employer and an employee have a kind of property relationship in the contract that they have with each other. So we have to start examining these kinds of relationships in ways that we just haven't been, been accustomed to, to doing. And certainly the educational systems that we've all worked through, um, which have been used to help condition our thinking, um, don't encourage that kind of inquiry, do they? These are not the kinds of questions that are going to be serviceable to the institutions for which school systems exist to, um, to educate the child or the young adult or, or whatever. Schools are not really interested so much in helping you maximize your understanding of the way things work in the world and so forth. They're more interested in certification. Schools are in the business of certification. You know, high schools certify you to college. Colleges certify you to the workplace or to graduate school. Uh, graduate schools certify you, let's say, in a law school, which is where I teach. Uh, we certify our graduates to the Bar Association. Bar Association gives them a bar exam to certify them to the public. And this becomes the main interest. It's not just in, you know, what is it that I really need in order to become self-controlling, self-owning uh, self kind of a person. I'm reminded of the line that the late Steve Jobs had about his experiences in the school. He said that they were just, he said they almost got, to, they almost got me. They were trying to introduce me to a form of discipline that I had never experienced and I didn't want to have to deal with it. And I said, they, all, they almost, almost got me and if they had, they would have destroyed me. Well, he managed to get himself out of that system. Uh, well, at least while to really be very, a very creative person. I think I just lost my my hearing.
Hold on. But there are a lot of areas that that our legal system gets into that we just, we don't question it. No, we don't question much of anything. <clears throat> One of the things has to do with eminent domain. What is eminent domain? Think the, think the words, the, the phrase through. Eminent domain, meaning someone has a prior claim, an eminent claim. Who, is, who might that be? Who has a prior claim of the ownership, to the ownership of things that you think you own? The state, which means they can take your property claim whenever they choose to do so. And we say, well, yes, but under eminent domain principles, the state has to pay the fair market value. There is no such thing as a fair market value for stolen goods. Anyone who babbles that kind of nonsense doesn't understand economics. Fair market value is premised upon the idea that there's a market. Someone who's taken something by force is negating the market. So what we say by the fair market value is the state will pay you what they want to pay you. That's it. And it's gotten so bad that we've now gotten into this area of asset forfeiture. If you drive around with a sufficient amount of money on, on your person, let's say a couple thousand dollars, for whatever reason, and some cop stops you and they say, oh, a couple thousand dollars, uh, we're just going to take that. That might be drug money. You might be a drug seller. You might be going to use that money to buy drugs. That's an illegal activity. And even though there's no evidence that you've done that, any of that, they just take it. And there's no remedy. And there, fortunately, there is one, one organization, I, I've always liked, the Institute for Justice has been taking on this issue. But it's just a question of, we can take what we want when we want to, because Bubis Americanus hasn't thought through the implications of, of ownership. If we did, if we really use the notion of, of self-ownership, if we really thought, well, we live in a society that believes in private property. No, we don't. We live in a society that enjoys the illusion that we have private ownership of property because we can do with our property, whatever the state allows us to do. Well, they had every bit same kind of rights in the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, any place. And if that's your definition of, of ownership of private property, what have you got? Anyway, any other any other questions, or shall I go on? Uh, Mark asks in the comments: uh, If you don't own your child, then what, if anything, gives you the right to exert control of them? Uh, you talked a little bit ago about uh, owning maybe a relationship. Uh, what kind of property interest would that relationship be? That's a that's a very good that's a very good question. Um, when I taught out at uh, Rampart College a few centuries ago, it seems, uh, that, that question would often come up in, in classes. Because at that time, I had two small children. My wife and I had two small children. One was one, and the other was about two and a half. And the question would usually took this form. Uh, let's suppose your next door neighbor comes over and takes your children, or takes one of your children, takes them over to his house and is torturing them or beating them or whatever. And you hear your kid screaming and hollering and daddy, daddy, come save me. Oh, this is awful. So what would you do? So would you go over and rescue your kid? I said, of course I would. Recognizing that my act of going onto his property is a trespass. Aha, aha. <laughs> You're saying you'd commit a trespass. Yeah, 
And I might take along a ball bat and commit another trespass on his head. Who knows? Would I do that? Yes, I would do that. But I would not change the definition of what I'm doing. It's still a trespass. I trespassed on his property in order to save my kid. Now, what's the nature of that <clears throat> relationship? I, I, I think when you get into the question of what constitutes good parenting, what you're really asking is at what point and through what process does the parent help the child learn to be a self-owning, self-controlling person? How do you do that? I mean, that, that's your job. It's, it's kind of like if, if you, uh, you know, are walking, out walking with your child and you come to a, a, a street corner, a busy street corner, and you insist that you know, the child take your hand. Well, okay. There's not any <laughs> anything terribly uh, disrespectful to the child in that. But what if the child reaches the age of 35 and you're still doing this? You've screwed up on your child raising responsibilities in some fashion. So I, I some well, yes, but even if you say that the child is a self being. Has the child ever asserted the claim of self ownership? To which my response has always been, have you? Have you with respect to yourself ever asserted a claim of self ownership? Have any of us done that? Um, and I think it's the parent maybe respecting that the child is very much self-directed that the the child is learning about the world in terms of direct experiences but also in terms of how the parents respond to to situations i've Often been critical of you. You see, you see adults in the world around them that you know you have a kid with one of these toys, you know, that has the round pegs and the square holes and the you know these star-shaped pegs and things of this sort. And the kid is supposed to figure out which one goes into which. And anyone who supervises a kid on that is just you know, as doesn't understand the nature of the toy. It's a, this is a self-correcting toy. There's only one way in which all pegs can be put in the right holes. There's no way that the square peg is going to go in the round hole and so forth. And so the, the kid is figuring this out. But how often do parents intervene and say, oh, no, 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 no. No, this, this star-shaped thing goes over here, not over there. Well, you've just cut off the kid's learning experience. And what is it that the kid has learned in the process? Well, at best, he's learned, if he's allowed to work it out, learned that there is a particular hole through which a particular peg can be placed. The kid has also learned that his or her life is going to be plagued by a lot of well-meaning Aunt Ediths we're going to be shrieking, no, 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 you know, you should do it this way instead of that way. That their learning experiences and the control over their lives are going to be claimed by a lot of well-meaning people. How does a parent prepare a child for that? Well, one way in which you prepare a kid for that is you be the kind of person that you would like your child to, to emulate. The, I've always considered the, the father of modern libertarian thinking, if you will, been Leonard Reed. Leonard Reed once 
he had written a book on I think, elements of libertarian leadership or something like that. He said, the way in which you promote these ideas is to be the kind of person that your values and your principles represent. You be that. And so in your dealings with the child, you deal with the child as though the child is self-owning, self-controlling. And you do this as far as you can short of allowing the kid to get into a position of danger where he can't recover. He says, you know, well, I want to go out and play in the street. Oh, well, okay, that's fine. You go out and play in the street. But if you recognize for a two-year-old that that's not really you know, the kind of decision that's going to be uh, beneficial to the child, you intervene. But if the kid wants to go out and do these things when he's 16, or 20 or whatever. You say, no, 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 no. I can't let you go out and walk because you might be like, hit by a truck or something like that. Well, you need to rethink your own, your own basic premises, I think. Anything else? Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of misconceptions about, about what proper relationships entail. What do you think are, are the biggest ones, perhaps, that you see with your law, law students? Law students are kind of a good guinea pig for just about any idea because they're more likely than the average person to think past the first step. but they are still at the age where most of them aren't yet uh, fully formed thinkers. Well, I don't know that I'm <laughs> at that place where I'm a fully formed thinker either, but your, your point's well taken. Um, I think the problem stems in part from the fact that I think we are too formally formally, not formally, formally educated. One of these days I'm going to write an article, a lengthy article, or maybe even a book on why I think that formal systems of education and the more advanced, the more sophisticated forms of education are very detrimental to human beings. I've known so many people in my life who are very very peaceful, very creative, very productive, very neighborly types of people who really didn't have that way of formal education. The ones who did, and the ones who really got, you know, some lottie from one of the top universities, the ones who have become, so many of them have become so structured in terms of their thinking that they can't think outside the circle. There's been such conditioning and people have identified themselves so much with their conditioning. We, we are institutionalized people. And an institution is an agency, at least as I define it, an agency that has become its own reason for being. It's more important than we are. This is the agency that is too big to fail. Have you heard that one? They are ends in themselves. And we identify ourselves with them. And once we identify ourselves with these agencies that are too big to fail, that are reasons for the, or be, that becomes who we are. And now someone comes along and questions that. What are they questioning? Just the institutional arrangement? No, you're questioning the student's sense of being, sense of identity. I, I, I think whatever changes are taking place in the world, I think, uh, very significant ones are taking place. I used to say years ago that Western civilization, the process of collapsing, I don't say that anymore. I speak of it in terms of it's already occurred. Western civilization is gone. The elements for it, sit down and, and play out what you think the basic elements, the important elements of, of 
so of a civilization are and ask yourself do we have that do we live in a peaceful society do we live in a society where human beings are respected or do we live in a society where the state can exert whatever force it wants to whenever it wants to you know police officers want to shoot somebody they shoot them there are no consequences want to go out and have a war someplace the state for whatever reason wants to have a war in lower Ruritania, just go bomb them kill them who cares there are no consequences for that that's that's the world that we live in and that kind of a world i think is going to i think is already in the process of disintegrating because it's filled with too many conflicts too many contradictions it can't sustain itself you can't sustain it you can't sustain a healthy system through lies and things of this of this nature so i think the whole system is in the process of of collapsing and at that point i think people have to become very introspective and say yeah how do i how do I survive in this kind of a world? How do I raise children in this kind of a world? How do I protect my children from this kind of foolishness? I've long had this idea that a, a person has a moral obligation to protect their children from living under a system of tyranny. And we don't do a very good job of that. We just pass it on. So, if I'm right, if, I, if the system is collapsing, much the same way the Soviet Union collapsed, it just went. It wasn't that suddenly 20 or 30 Russians had read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and said, hey, look at this. Woman, and she's from Russia. This woman says she's kind of a bad system. Well, I didn't know that. Well, that's just close off this system and go to something else. It, it's not. The system just could no longer sustain itself with all of the contradictions and the lies and the conflicts and the distortions that institutional behavior depends upon. This is the reality of it. The encouraging part of all that is I am very, very optimistic of the future. I think life will rediscover itself. I always like Albert J. Knox's reference to the remnant, who, when he said the uh, the system will, when the system collapses, the remnant will be those who are familiar enough with the, the principles and the conditions and the values and so forth upon which a healthy, productive, free, and creative society is going to be built, that they will put it back together under different principles. And I think one of these is going to be the property principle. We have, we have run through the anti-private property principle. Not, it's not so much that the state disrespects property. The state demands respect for its property. And the state presumes that you can, well, you have to expect to your property what it wants. But does the state have to deal with that? Do the same thing. And are, are you able to uh, impose upon the state the same uh, sense of will that the state wants to impose upon you? No. Go to a government-owned property, and it's encircled by barbed wire, and they have troops out there, and they'll shoot you if you want to insist on coming onto the property, and so forth. Meanwhile, you're back home, and they want to come onto your property, and if you resist, they'll shoot you again. <clears throat> That's the nature of the culture that we live in, and I think you begin <clears throat> putting that back together by an understanding of the basic basic elements and the one basic element that i continue to find is that of the private property principle because what it really says is each individual is an end in himself or herself 
And that when we acknowledge that with respect to people, that what we have in common with other people is not some kind of a collective, uh, you know, stomping into some brave new world. But the relationship that we have to others is based upon the idea that each has this need for self-ownership, need for self-control, self-direction, and that's what we have in common with each other. And we need to come to one another's defense when that is challenged. It's, and we see this in so much in the area of so-called news reports. You know, somebody does some, some terrible thing. How do people respond? They respond by embracing the state. Why? Why would you do that? What you need to do, I think, is to embrace one another, particularly when the state is the, is the wrongdoer. When this stems from the failure to respect <clears throat> property boundaries. There's a great line in, toward the close of the movie, um, uh, Judgment at Newark, where Spencer Tracy's playing with part of the judge, and he's saying something, and saying that we have to make a decision on the basis of what's important for us to stand for. <clears throat> and that this is difficult when standing for something is, is the most difficult. It's easy to stand for something when there's no cost involved in it. But when all hell is breaking loose, what is it that you stand for? And one of the things that he listed there was the the, 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 the respect for every individual, respect for a single human life. That it was not two or four or six million people who were killed in the concentration camps that made it wrong. It was wrong as the first time you did it to anybody. It doesn't get any worse than that in principle. You just repeat the wrong. You don't, in, you don't make it worse. And we live in such a collective mindset that we assume that, well, it really isn't bad until you start killing off 10 or 15 or 20 million people. What if you just killed off one person? It tells you something about the nature of the, of the culture that you live in. It's a sick culture that that can happen and there are no consequences. So there. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we seem to have, uh, we're, we're running up on our, our time limits here. I want to thank you for speaking to us tonight. Hey, it's been cat, wonderful cat. as usual. There's a kitty cat. Yes. Oh. This is a kitty cat who is not respecting my, uh, my property boundaries. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think you, think you own that cat? That cat thinks it owns the, you. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, this cat is very sure that it owns me and attempts to assert that claim against my wife yeah. uh, all the time. Yeah, I, I like cats. I've always been a fan of cats. I do too. I think they're natural anarchists. Well, they really are. What, what's the old saying about trying to organize a herd of cats? <laughs> good luck, yeah, fella. It's, um, yeah, good luck. People uh, had told me uh, when I embarked upon this job, you know, organizing you know, libertarians for talks, they said, oh, it'll be like herding cats. Well, I have a lot of experience herding my own cats, and libertarians are actually usually tougher. Well, and yeah, and, and, and the question with regard to libertarians or whoever else is, why would you need to have them kind of organized in any particular way of, of thinking? That's always been a standard joke that I've had. The trouble with us anarchist types is we need to get better organized. Well, that's a you know, sort of a contradiction. Well, it's not a contradiction in terms. It's <laughs> recognizing that the organization is voluntary, peaceful, so forth. But, yeah, I, I, I think we learn so much more in situations where we question each other. 
I, I, I don't, I, I've run into very few people who agree with everything I say. My wife and I don't agree to, on everything. No, well, that's fine. That's where you learn something. I had one of my, <clears throat> one of my colleagues who died a few years ago, he and I got along so beautifully. And he was always saying, I, I just really enjoy everything you have to say and everything you write. Every time you do an article, would you send it to me? And I said, sure, which I did. He said, I don't agree with very much of what you say, <laughs> but I enjoy listening to it. That's all you can ask. All you can ask is for someone to listen. And if they'll do that, okay. Now they've heard something. They've heard something they haven't heard before. And the next time they hear it, it's not going to be quite so strange. And the third or fourth time they hear it, it's going to be more familiar to them. About the fifth time they hear it, they're going to say, I've always thought that way. This is the way we learn. And it's fun. It's fun. What's the cat's name? Hi, Annabelle. Uh, this is Annabelle. Uh, my other cat who uh, actually, I, I I tried to kick them out of the room, and apparently I missed this one. Uh, the other <laughs> one is Murray Fluffbar. <laughs> well, very good. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank you for, uh, for speaking with us tonight. Uh, we've got you back on January 22nd. Uh, you'll be talking mm -hmm. on the topic of uh, Wizards of Ozymandias. So I, I'm excited for that one. I hope everyone else is too. That'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern on January 22nd. Hope to see you all back here. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, we've, we've got a few more talks coming up here in the next week. We've got uh, Jeffrey Tucker's the continuation of his Liberty Classics series with uh, Orson Sweat Mar Martin's The Joys of Living. Uh, and then uh, on Monday night, we've got Wendy McElroy, uh, George Donnelly, and uh, J.P. Medved here to talk about their new uh, sci-fi anthology of libertarian short stories uh, called Defiant She Advanced. And we've got some great stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks, so hope to see you all back with us. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for Thank coming, you. and have Thank a great night. Matt. Take Thanks, care, Cal. Butler. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>